Right, so now we move on to section 3.4 on sequence spaces. We need a good supply of norm spaces and Banach spaces to discuss all the concepts we're dealing with in this module. We haven't got very many examples yet. Uh, there's a few scattered in the module so far, but we could do with more, and we could certainly do with more infinitely dimensional uh, norm spaces to work with. So let's have a look at our notation for this section. F to the n, it's the set of all sequences, but of course it's also could be regarded as a product space uh, in the usual way, and we will do that later. You can think of this as a product of one copy of F. That's the same as a product over N in the natural numbers of F. In other words, a product of lots of copies of the same thing, which is the same thing as functions from the natural numbers to F. But as we know, there's no real difference between functions from the natural numbers to a set and sequences in the set, because, well, what is a sequence? It's something where you've got a, a term for each n, which is like having a function from the natural numbers. And if you've got a function from the natural numbers, then what is f of n? It's just a sequence. So there's no real difference between sequences and functions um, from the natural numbers. So we'll uh, regard f to the n as the same thing either way. So that's f to the natural numbers, the set of all functions from the natural numbers to f, which is the same as the set of all sequences, and that's xn running from 1 to infinity in this module. That's our default. Unless I say otherwise, our sequences start from, a, from term 1. Now, there's a very important subspace of this. Oh, I'm, assum I'm assuming actually that you know how to add sequences together, term by term, and multiply by scalars, and that you're, you're not going to be surprised that I say that sequences form a vector space. Um, that's that's uh, term-wise operations, or coordinate-wise. Add two sequences means you add the corresponding terms in each. Scalar multiple of a sequence means you multiply all of the terms in the sequence by the same scalar. Now here's an important subspace. Those sequences which are, as they say, eventually zero. That means there's only at most finitely many non-zero terms. Well, if you allow zero, then you just say finitely many non-zero terms, including possibly no non-zero terms. Um, also known as the sequences with compact support because uh, the compact subsets of the natural numbers are exactly the finite subsets. Uh, but we'll think of it as C00, or they're also called finite sequences, um, but actually they're not really finite sequences. They're sequences where there's most finitely many non-zero terms, and then they're zero from then onwards. Um, but you don't know how far you have to go before it starts being zero, so it varies. But if you add a term, if you've got one sequence which has only a million non-zero entries and another sequence that's only got a billion non-zero entries and you add them, um, then your new sequence has at most one billion, one million non-zero entries. Um, so, so here you are. It's, uh, in terms of capital N, it means that there is some natural number so that from that point on, all terms are zero. And if you've got two sequences like that, you take the maximum of their n's because they each have their own n, and you can take the maximum of the two, and from that term onwards, the sum will be zero. Now, I'm, when I do the theory in this section, I don't want to keep doing the proof separately for the reals and the complexes. But if I do want to refer to, to tell you which case we're in, then I might say, real C00 or complex C00 or something like that. And the same for some of the other sequence spaces that are coming up. Now, depending on your definition of the polynomials, 
you will either say that C00 is isomorphic to, or you'll say it is the vector space of all polynomials with coefficients in your scalar field. Has anybody ever had a formal definition of what the polynomials are? What is the polynomial ring over a particular field, for example? Did anyone meet a, a formal definition? Yes? Let's Yes. That's right. So there's, uh, there's finally many non-zero coefficients, and then the rest of the coefficients are zero. And uh, some people, dis there's a distinction between polynomial functions and polynomials. And it's an important distinction, because if you're working over a finite field, like the field with two elements, you can have different polynomials which give the same polynomial function. For example, um, x squared, um, oh, let's try to get this right, x squared plus x is always zero working over the field with two elements. But it's not the zero polynomial. It's a zero polynomial function, but, it's, but as a polynomial, it's got coefficients of x squared and x, and those are not the zero coefficients. So something funny happens with these finite fields that doesn't happen with, say, fields of so-called characteristic zero, like the rationals or the reals or the complex numbers, that there is a, a real difference between the polynomial functions and the polynomials. Fortunately for us, there's not that much difference. Uh, you can prove that the uh, polynomial functions 1, x, x squared, x cubed for us are independent, which isn't true um, over the field of two elements as polynomial functions. Um, x and x squared are the same. So I'll leave you to look at that again, and then you'll see that uh, C00 has got a countable Hamel basis, so it's countably infinite dimensional, and that means you can't make it into a Banach space no matter how hard you try. Any norm you put on it will be incomplete. Now we want some more sequence spaces. And these are the ones that are going to be Banach spaces. There's so little LP spaces and C sub zero. Not C, and so this one is different. This one's only got one zero. So again, real or complex. And some books, by the way, put the P at the top. Um, so if you find a P at the top, don't worry. It's still the same thing. In fact, I may forget and put the P at the top. Um, Some authors write little lp with a p at the top. And I'm not entirely consistent myself. So if I do put a p at the top, I mean the same thing. Now remember, this is for p um, greater to 1 and strictly less than infinity, so that you can take p powers of positive numbers or non-negative numbers. P could be irrational, P could be pi, but usually for us, P will be 1, 2, or later, infinity, um, but not infinity yet. This corresponds to the uh, norms we've already seen on finite dimensional spaces and on continuous functions. This time we're summing from 1 to infinity. And you take those sequences, so the sums of the pth powers of the modulus is finite. If p is 1, that just means the sum of the moduli should be finite. p is 2 is like an inner product space, a Hilbert space. It's a standard little l2. If you've done Hilbert spaces, then you'll have seen that before. And of course, then you want to define a norm. Well, you have to take the p for root. So note then um, for xn in L1, um, norm Xn, the one norm, is just the sum of the moduli and that's finite. 
And for exit in L2, you take the 2 norm, and that's the square root of the sum of the squares of the moduli. Again, finite. Because L2 is where it's defined to be those sequences where that's finite. And that comes from an inner product. And if you've done Hilbert spaces, you'll uh, um, come across those, you'll know that comes, that's an inner product space um, and a Hilbert space. Then uh, that's the little LPs. Then you've got little l infinity and c sub zero, which are defined as follows. Uh, little l infinity is just the bounded sequences. So it's those xn, so the supremum of the modulus is finite, so this is the bounded sequences. And these ones are the null sequences. C0 are the null sequences, the sequences which tend to 0. In between, by the way, between these two are the convergent sequences that don't have to converge to 0, um, which is a nice uh, vector space as well line between the two. But uh, we'll focus, for the moment at least, on C0 and L infinity. You give both of them the same norm, the soup norm, defined by to be the supremum of the modulus of Xn. Remember that a convergent sequence is always bounded. So convergent sequences are always bounded, so um, C0 is contained in little L infinity for that reason. Convergent sequences are bounded, though, of course, bounded sequences don't have to be convergent. So since C0 is a subset of L infinity, um, you can use the same norm on both of them. One is really the restriction of the other, but that's standard abuse of notation. That's a genuine soup for little l infinity, doesn't have to be a maximum. Different for C0, but uh, for, for little l infinity, it may well not be a maximum. It's quite easy to, to think up a function, uh, think up a sequence that's bounded, but which doesn't have a maximum modulus element. Does anybody know one? Who knows a sequence which is bounded, but which doesn't have an element of maximum modulus? Yeah, take xn equals 1 minus 1 over n, then xn is bounded. And the supremum over natural numbers of modulus xn is 1, but none of them actually have modulus 1. So there's an example of a sequence whose norm is 1, but where none of the terms have got modulus 1. So it's a genuine supremum, not a maximum. Now I will leave it to you to check that L1, L2, L infinity, C0 are vector spaces. Which basically means you've got to show they're subspaces of f to the n. And I'll leave it to you 
to check that norm 1, norm 2, norm infinity are norms on those bases. Uh, we'll have a look at... Um, and the fact that C0 is a proper subspace of L-infinity is pretty easy because we've just given an example of something that's in L-infinity but not in C0. Uh, it's less obvious what happens with the other Ps. And I'll refer you to the books to look at the inequalities of Holder, Holder and Minkowski, uh, which we won't have time to look at in this module, but which are very interesting. Again, you can look in Rudin's book, Real and Complex Analysis, or other books on functional analysis. I'm not going to go through the details of that. So we will be assuming that those are all vector spaces and that these things that I've said are norms are genuinely norms. I won't prove that in this module, but you can quote that from now on. Unless, of course, you're asked in a question to prove something about them, you're allowed to assume that standard results. So, so those are what I call standard facts. So you can quote these. unless specifically asked to prove something about these facts. So I could set you an exercise that says, let's prove some of the details of this. That would be the only situation in which I wouldn't let you assume these standard facts. So what we're going to be doing next time is, and it's going to take us a long time to do this, prove, it's going to take quite a long time to get through this, prove theorem 3.15, which tells you all the standard facts that these are Banach spaces. We're assuming they're vector spaces. We're assuming that these things are norms on them. So what we're going to be doing is proving that they're complete under those assumptions. And I won't fill in all the details, but I'll do quite a lot. And uh, various other relationships like when is C00 dense, when isn't it dense, and uh, the fact that C0 is closed in L-infinity, things like that. Okay, so we'll start putting together lots of details of that tomorrow. <laughs>